Hey, I'm going to pray for us. Uh, God has put this message on my heart for several weeks now. I think, man, I think there's something in here that every one of us, myself included, needs to hear today. And I'm just going to ask God's very selfishly, a little extra, extra measure of blessing. So if you're watching online or you're here in the room, would you join me in prayer? Father, I just invite you in. For those online, would you come into the space that they're in, whether it's a living room, it's a bedroom, maybe they're sitting in their car listening to this a couple days later. Would you come into that space? Holy Spirit, would you come here? Would your spirit hang heavy in this space? And Father, would you, would you speak through me? Would you speak into me? And that Father, would today not be a day that we just check the church box, but that Father, today would be a day that we encounter you because it's only through encountering you that we are changed. We invite you. We are here. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Several years ago, a relative of mine had what I would call a crisis of faith. See, this, this relative, she's, she's got a couple kids, and, and she had become kind of connected to that line of thought, that, that, that kind of section of faith that believes that once you put your faith in Jesus, it's rainbows, it's unicorns, right? It's just happiness. The decimal point in your account just keeps moving to the right, right? It's all of those good things, right? What we call the prosperity gospel, the name it, claim it kind of brand of faith, right? They'd kind of fallen into that. And so they'd reached a crisis of faith because their kids had encountered a really painful season. And this relative of mine, man, they just didn't know what to do with it, right? They didn't have a context theologically for when bad things happen to good people, right? Anybody been there, right? I'm sure there's a couple of us, right? You're like, but, but wait, Jesus, I thought this. Well, I thought this was true. And it just revealed a lack of depth of understanding of their faith. Right? They didn't have a context, they didn't have a framework. And so when they're watching their kids go through this difficult and painful time, mostly what they did, they would just put on blinders and kind of la, 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 la. I, you know, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna ignore that that's even out there. They forgot that Jesus said in John 16, in this life you will have much trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world, right? I just, I don't understand that brand of faith. I don't personally, I just go, you, that, that brand of faith, I go, you haven't even had a cursory reading of scripture, right? But it's that brand of faith where it's like the storm of tragedy hit the life of their kids and they just didn't know what to do with it. And so it kind of shipwrecked them for a season. You see, their understanding of scripture and of their faith did not prepare them for the reality that they had now faced, and I think this is true for many of us, right? A difficult season, a painful death, maybe a shifting cultural norm, broken relationship, on and on, right? Whatever that storm is, these and many other storms, they test our faith. And they often reveal how anchored or not anchored we are to our faith. That's the reason for this series, right? The elephant in the room. And this is kind of the, the high, lay, high level truth I think is true for many of us is that avoiding the deep truths of Christianity results in a faith that is unable to withstand the storms of life, right? There are things that are difficult about our faith, right? There are things you just go, gosh, that's really hard. It would be a lot easier if it really was if Jesus just said, believe in me and only goodness and more money will follow you. Be like, yes, I'm in. Sign me up. But he know he says things like, in this world, you will have trouble. Wait a minute, what? He just says that if you cling to me, know that we will overcome because I will be moving in and through you. Right. We often treat truths that we don't fully understand or that make us uncomfortable like elephants in the room, dancing around them at the expense of anchoring ourselves to a deeper faith that will sustain us. See, this relative of mine, she hadn't anchored herself to the deeper truth, the, the reality that, that actually storms will come, that actually Jesus tells that you're gonna experience pain, hardship, if anything, because you now follow me, it might get worse. And so they're unprepared for those kind of storms and the trees of their lives get toppled over. And so what? We're, we're just not going to avoid those things. We're going to dig deeper into them. 
And so as part of the series, we've looked at a few of these elephants of the room. We began week one with the Word of God, right? The Word of God, the Bible. That in itself has been this, this kind of elephant in the room, I think, for many of us. Because it's like, well, well, I like some of what it says, but there's several things I don't like. And so I'm going to treat it like a buffet. I'm going I'm to take the things I like. I'm going to embrace those. I'm just going to set aside the things I don't. I'm going to treat it like an elephant in the room. Because, you know, I Googled it once, and it says that I should be skeptical about it. When in fact, it stands the test of time that the Word of God, Scripture, is a wholly unique book that has been supernaturally shepherded down through the ages to you and I, and that we can actually approach it with confidence. That like the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, 4, 12, the for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And so because it is that, we don't have to approach it with skepticism. No, we can approach it with confidence. Right, that was week one, the, the word of God. And then Stone, give it up for Stone. Did a great job last week. Right, so the first elephant was the word of God. The second elephant was the way of God. Right, we, we live in a culture right now that, man, it's okay that there can be a way to God, right? You can have your way, I can have my way. Or you can have, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G way to God. But when it becomes the way to God, mm, people get a little nervous. And so now it's an elephant in the room. We're going to dance around. All of a sudden you're like, boy, you got very specific. And for some reason we equate Jesus' specificity with some form of exclusivity. And that's not true. He knew that we faced a specific problem, our sin. He knew that our specific problem was is that we were separated from a holy God. And so he specifically gives us the way forward. When he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's not exclusive. He's being specific because that's the best way he could have loved us. That's the second elephant in the room. And now we come to Week three, today's elephant is the wrath of God. Week one was the word of God to the way of God. Today is the wrath of God. I know those of you that are visiting, maybe you're watching online, you're like, I've been hoping. If we could just talk about the wrath of God, boy, I'm so excited. I mean, I want you to hang with me here today, I really do. I think there is so much confusion, distrust, and I think fear around the wrath of God. And yet, my hope is that by the end of our time here today, that you will see that the wrath of God is foundational. Foundational, hear me in this, in, vic in victorious and hope-filled living. That actually there is hope and victory because of the wrath of God. And understand that for me personally, this has been a significant elephant in the room in my own life. I have pushed against it, ignored it, and avoided it. No, I want nothing to do with God's wrath. And I bet I'm not alone. Anybody here go, yeah, give me some wrath. <laughs> don't you raise your hand, Robin. I psyched you out there for a minute. You're like, what? oh, no, I don't, want, I don't want God's wrath. No, we don't want that. We push away from it. We try to get as far away from God's wrath as, as much as possible. I have done that for years in my own life, particularly as young men, at my own peril. You see, grace, grace I get. Grace, I'm drawn to, right? The idea of Jesus, the incarnate God, lovingly embracing me, all of me, as I am hot mess and all, all my spoken and unspoken sins, that's incredible. Yes, I will take every bit of that. I don't deserve it, but I'm here for it. I'll take all the grace that Jesus offers me. You see, I love the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes, please. Yes. But you see, he's not just the Lamb of God. He's more. See, it's the other side of that coin that makes me uncomfortable. Is he the Lamb of God? Yes. But Jesus is also the Lion of Judah whose wrath is poured out on all sin whose anger burns against all evil, who will judge the living and the dead and who will return with a name on his thigh and a sword in his hand. That Jesus makes me squirm. 
That Jesus makes me very uncomfortable. You're right. When John the Baptist sees Jesus coming down the hillside at the River Jordan, he proclaims, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm like, yes, behold. But the Lion of Judah, whose bowls of wrath are poured out against sin and evil, oh, that I'm not as big a fan of. It makes me uncomfortable. See, here's the thing. Distancing ourselves from God's righteous wrath diminishes his ability to refine us and eradicate the sin in our lives. See, we can't have it just one way, right? We, we aren't given. Jesus doesn't give us that option to take a buffet approach to his nature, to his character. We don't get to just go, I'll take, I'll take a double portion of the Lamb of God while I'm just gonna set aside the Lion of Judah. No, he doesn't do that because he loves us too much, because he knows that distancing ourselves from his righteousness and wrath diminishes his ability to refine us and eradicate sin in our lives. Let me ask you a question, right? Do you struggle with the same sins and mistakes over and over again? Don't you raise your hand. Do you struggle with the same mistakes and sins over and over again? I'm not the only one in that category. Right, I'm certainly better, I'm closer to what Scripture describes as sanctification, right? The process of being refined, right? I'm closer, but our lack of struggle, I want to say it's because we don't understand God's wrath. Does your faith journey feel like running on a treadmill, expending lots of energy, but getting nowhere? I believe that a deeper understanding of God's wrath can lead to personal transformation, let me say that again. A deeper understanding of God's wrath, Jesus' wrath, can lead to personal transformation. But there's a problem. See, the problem is, is we like to divorce the wrath of God from the person of Jesus. Right? So many of us do that. I've been guilty of this, right? You look at the Old Testament God, wrathful, wiping out people, killing people, right? People struck dead, those kind of things, right? Entire, entire communities, right? A, a town, a city, right? Destroyed. And you're like, well, that can't be true. I'm going to take Jesus, suffering servant. Yes. Good shepherd. Yes, not the God who calls down fire and brimstone on the entire town of Gomorrah. No, I'll take the good shepherd. I'll take the Jesus who, who tells me to forgive 70 times seven. I'll take the Jesus who says to turn the other cheek. I'll, I'll take the Jesus who looks at the crowds with compassion, not the God of the Old Testament who sends a flood to eradicate evil across the globe can't be the same. I'll take the Jesus who tells the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. And I get it, man, I, I'm there with you, right? We celebrate Jesus as compassionate father, which he is, but avoid him as righteous judge and conquering king. This is a problem. You see, we cannot separate Jesus from both his natures. He's one, he is the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah. Embracing the one while denying the other leaves us with a neutered faith and a foundational misunderstanding of who Jesus is and his ultimate purpose. And so we've got to, we've got to unite these two ideas. We've got to, we've got to understand that the, that the God we see in the Old Testament is the incarnate God revealed to us in Jesus in the New Testament. They are one and the same. They are full and complete in both their natures. And so I want you to see, we're going to look at a couple passages here, and you're going to see that this is the same Jesus, is the Jesus of the Old Testament. There's the same nature there. Right, Jesus says, I did not come to, to change the law, but to fulfill it. He's the fulfillment of everything that we saw in the Old Testament, complete in the person of Jesus. So go with me. This is Matthew 18. A little background, we're going to pick it up here in verse 6 here in a minute. But Jesus, he's been, he's been teaching, he's been sharing his thoughts, right? And the crowd, everybody's just like cut to the core whenever they hear Jesus speak. And then in specific, I love this image, right? Children are naturally drawn to Jesus. I love that image. 
And so the kids, right, they would just come to him. And I just picture Jesus sitting, right, kind of Indian style in the grass or whatever. And kids are just, he's like the human jungle gym, right? He's the favorite uncle, the grandpa, right, that the kids can't stay away from. And the disciples are like, guys, guys, back off. Let the rabbi teach. And Jesus is like, no, 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 let him come to me. I love that image. And in the midst of this sweet scene, Jesus uses this as an opportunity to hit home a really a profound metaphor and a truth that we need to not miss here. Pick it up here in verse six. He says this, he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, and picture, right, Jesus sitting on the floor, maybe, kids, right, he's got kids all over him, climbing around, and he's like speaking over them as they're crawling over him. You know, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, look at what he says here. It'd be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And he probably says it with a bit of a smile, huh? Did you catch that? This loving, grace-giving, joy-filled Jesus just said that if someone leads children, and by extension, again, there's a metaphor here he's giving us, those young in their faith astray, or leads them to believe less than the complete truth, that person will be forcefully and unremorsefully drowned to the depths of the ocean. And he gets very graphic about it. He's not subtle, right? Kids climbing over him, oh, let the children come to me. Oh, by the way, if anybody leads these little ones, those young in their faith astray, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna take a millstone. And then he gets specific, not just any millstone, no, a large millstone, right? 10, 15 feet in diameter. This is what was used to mash grain for an entire community. We're going to take that. We're going to drive them out to the middle of the ocean. We're going to tie it around their neck. We're going to pitch them over the side and watch as they sink and the air erupts out of their lungs. Oh, and by the way, what I'm describing would be better for them than what will actually happen. Jesus is not playing when it comes to leading people away from his truth. It's got to be one of those moments if you're the disciples. Wait, did, did you just hear what he said? This is the same Jesus. The same God from the Old Testament is the Jesus revealed in the new. And he doesn't stop there. Goes into verse seven. He says, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. You always have to be aware in scripture when they repeat themselves, right? What are the two, what, how does he repeat himself? Woe, it's the Greek word, oai. It's a primal scream of grief and dread exclaimed in the face of certain destruction. It's the sound that you would hear in the cabin of an airplane going down. That level of scream of pain and grief and dread. It's the screams of a village that is about to be bombed from above. And Jesus tells us that that very personal woe, that scream of grief and dread is in store for those leading others astray. This is the same God that we see in the Old Testament. See, the wrath of God will be upon those causing people to stumble at the truth of the gospel. And you go, well, Joel, you know, that's just one isolated example. Okay, well, let's try this on. Let's move into John chapter 2. John chapter 2 finds Jesus. He's coming into Jerusalem. He's, he's there outside in the temple courts. It's, it's around Passover time. Passover, it's the highest holy day in the Jewish calendar, right? It's where they commemorate and remind themselves of God's faithfulness to lead them out of Egypt and out of bondage. And for a Jew, if you're an obedient, observant Jew, which most all Jews, Jews were, right? You came to Jerusalem and you offered sacrifices for yourself, for your family, offerings as prescribed in the book of Leviticus, right? Because the temple is the center of your world. And so you've got all these pilgrims, they're coming into Jerusalem and then required of them are different, you know, different animals and grains and different offerings, again, prescribed by God in the Levitical law. It's into this scene that we pick it up here in verses 13 and 14. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And, and be clear, during, Jerus during the Passover, Jerusalem swells to about three times its size. So it's over 100,000 people. It says, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. See, here's what was happening. 
is that we as people, right, we never miss an opportunity to make a buck. And that's what had happened in the temple courts. People were making money off of others' devotion and faithfulness. See, people had gotten together, realized, oh, people are coming into town. Oh, this is a great time. I'm going to make a year's worth of money in this one week because I'm going to I'm going to come out with all the animals, with all the doves, with all the right, with all the grains, all that, and I'm going to sell it. I'm going to gouge people who are coming here, seeking just to obey what God has commanded them to do. See, they had turned obedience to God's commandments into personal profiteering and profiling. And this Jesus, the Lion of Judah, could not abide. So what happens? John 15, John 2, 15. So Jesus, he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money chainers and overturned their tables. Again, did you catch this? First, he methodically and purposefully makes a whip. Right, Jesus comes in, pictures the scene. He sees, right, all these men, they're making money off of people's faithfulness. He's so moved by it. He's so angry, filled with wrath and rage. He goes and he sits down premeditated. He gets the materials necessary. He takes his time to make a whip. Right, he's like, I'm gonna make a good one. Oh, I'm at, you know, you can just sit, right? The disciples are like, what's he doing? And he's just sitting, you can just see him. Sometimes I would see my dad get more angry by the dumber things I'd say to him, right? I, I'd be like, oh, he's angry. I'd say something, I'd just make it worse, right? And you picture him, he's just looking at these guys. He's tightening the cords. He's making it this whip, right? So he makes a whip out of cords, methodically, purposely, with the intention to use it on others. He didn't just hold it in the air and wave it. Don't make me use this. Also, let's paint an even more realistic picture. There in the temple courts with the tables and animals, there would have easily been 20 to 30 grown men. And what was most important to these men? Their inventory and their money. What would it have taken to drive out all these materially focused men from their very livelihoods? Right, think about it. We learn in the passage, right, these men leave all of their stuff, all of their money, and they run. Right, it says Jesus drives them out. What would it have taken? Would it have been a Bible verse being quoted at them? Would that have caused them to drop everything and run? What about a strong side eye? Would that have caused them to run? What about a, a well-worded retort from Jesus? No, much more than that. He made the whip to use the whip hollering and whipping these evil men who were taking advantage of others. Then he whipped the animals and turned over all the tables. This took time, intensity, and a level of righteous anger we don't often ascribe to Jesus. Grown men went running in fear at the wrath Jesus displayed. Moving on. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Again, this was not whispered. It was not calmly delivered. No, hollering in righteous indignation, get these out of here. His tone was not subtle. His demeanor was not mild. He was mad and he was wrathful and no one thought otherwise. No one was confused Everyone was picking up what Jesus was putting down. We get confused. We confuse the Old Testament God with a Jesus that always turns the other cheek because he doesn't always. When others were profiteering off of people's faithfulness and obedience, Jesus turned a whip against them and in righteous anger drove them out. This is the same Jesus. It's the same God from the Old Testament. And finally, there's this scene, a scene that I'm gonna share this later, but gives me so much hope when there are things I just don't understand. See, the apostle John, he's given a vision. God gives him the ability to see the future of all things. See how God's gonna work it all out, right? He's the, the consolation of God's grand plan is all gonna come to a head. And he gives John this ability to see into the future. And John records this for us in Revelation 19. John writes, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. 
With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. Again, look at this, Jesus. Don't miss it. He is faithful and true. He judges and wages war. His eyes like blazing fire, a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. Is he the suffering servant? Yes. Is he the lamb of God? Yes. But make no mistake, he is also the lion of Judah who comes to root out and destroy sin and evil. And we, you, me, need him to be that for our very own lives and the lives of all who suffer from the all-reaching destruction of sin and evil in the world. We need the lion of Judah to wage war against all who do evil in his sight. John goes on records this. He says, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he is the Lion of Judah who treads the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. He is both fully, completely, and always one and the same. And to embrace the one while avoiding the other is to diminish his power and his purpose and ultimately to discount, hear me on this, to discount his love. To discount his love. Follow me in this. You see, scripture teaches us in 1 John 4 that God is what? God is love. And we know that Jesus said in John 10, 30 that he is in fact God. Therefore, Jesus is love. And we must understand that his love doesn't come after his wrath or as some sort of antidote to the wrath of God. No, love is his character and nature and all that he does flows from that one truth that he is love. It is because of his love that he placed himself upon that cross that we could not carry. It is because of his love that he died the death that we could not die. It is also because of his love that his wrath is poured out on sin and evil. It's his love that pours out his wrath. It is because of his love that he rages against those that would lead others astray. It is because of his love that he pours his anger on those who would stand in the way of others' faithfulness. And it is because of his love that he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. As he will one day say, enough. Enough. Woe to you, to all who harm, hurt, and lead astray any that he purchased when he freely gave of his life. All of it flows out of his love. All of it does. And we need it to. Like I said, I, right, I'm, I'm drawn to his grace and, and we should be. And his grace is true. See, God's grace is his love pursuing our hearts. I think that's, that's easy for most of us to understand when you look and you go, man, I don't, I don't deserve it, right? I'm unworthy of it, God. And so, so we naturally feel that love by his grace pursuing our hearts, right? God's grace is his love pursuing our hearts. What we miss sometimes is the other side. God's wrath is his love pursuing sin and evil, And both have to be true for him to be perfectly loving. You see, God's wrath is necessary for evil to be eliminated and for all of us to be transformed. You can't have it just one-sided. It must be both. I read this quote this last week from author Aaron Wilson. He says, The sacrificial death of Christ transformed God's enemies who were exposed to his wrath into God's children who are sheltered by his love. Isn't that great? Oh man, he, he says it better than I, so I just go, I'm just gonna quote him. The sacrificial death of Christ transformed God's enemies. And who are God's enemies? All of us, right? Two categories in all of existence, a holy God and jacked up humanity. Which category are you in? 
right? He says, the sacrificial death of Christ transformed God's enemies who were exposed to his wrath into God's children who are sheltered by his love. So what then should be our response to this truth? What then should be our response if we no longer treat God's wrath as an elephant in the room? I give you three things. And they're all physical things. I I just think in these kind of terms. First is this. You want to understand, you want to dig deeper into God's wrath. Number one is kneel in confession. Kneel in confession. I love the scene of the prophet Isaiah in chapter six, right? He's brought into the throne room of God Almighty. He drops to his knees and cries out, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, right? His first response when confronted with the true holiness, righteousness of God is to kneel and confess his sin. Again, this This should lead us this way. There there is hope, there is life here, right? If we understand God's wrath, it causes us to kneel. Confession is such an underused tool in the toolkit of believers. Scripture tells us, right, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. What's our first response to understanding God's wrath? Kneel and confess. The psalmist writes, Psalm 32, five, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Man, what does it look like in your life to kneel in confession? Maybe that's as you're listening to this, if you're online, maybe it's in the room, it's later today, maybe it's exactly where you're sitting. Maybe it's just mentally a posture of just going, Lord, I confess I confess my lies, I confess my greed, I confess my pride, I confess my lust, right? Whatever that list is, kneel in confession. Number two, after we kneel in confession, walk in humility. Walk in humility. Here's what Old Testament believers always understood and appreciated. God sets his face against injustice, evil, and all sin. This includes every one of us. Right, his wrath is always against sin and evil. You see, we don't need to live in fear of God, but it is to our benefit that we deeply respect his power. So first, we're gonna kneel in confession. Two, we're gonna walk in humility. The prophet Micah says this in 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. You see, humility is necessary when walking with the Lion of Judah. So the two things, right? First two things we're going to do as we understand this elephant, we're no longer going to avoid it. We're going to recognize it as a very nature of God, actually as an outflow of his love. And so we're going to kneel in confession and we're going to walk in humility. Third one is this, we are going to run from sin. We're going to kneel, we're going to walk, and then we're going to run from sin. This is the most practical and obvious one, but often the least applied. Run from the thing you know to be wrong. Run from it. Right, we're really quick to ask forgiveness, most of us are, and then we keep going back to it. Keep doing the thing. No, run from it. Don't keep tempting yourself with it. God's wrath is against all sin. We wonder why we keep experiencing God's wrath and discipline. I just don't understand. I don't understand why I keep facing these negative consequences in my life. Well, do you keep going back to the same sin? Yeah, I know, I don't get it. Maybe stop it. Maybe run from it. He loves us too much to look past our wrongdoing. He loves us too much to leave us unrepentant in our sin. He rages against sin always for our sake and for our refinement. The Apostle Paul writing to his spiritual son, Timothy says this, but you, man of God, flee from all this. He's been describing some sins and he's like, no, flee from them. Literally run from them. And run towards what? Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Friends, again, watching online or here in the room. What is that sin you have not yet ran from? What are those painful consequences you keep choosing to accept? Aren't you tired? No, church. Let today be a different day. 
where we say we will no longer avoid the elephant in the room of Jesus' wrath. No, we will seek to understand it more fully, to see that Jesus is not at war with us. He is at war with our sin and with evil all around the world. And our sin cannot be eliminated without there first being a death. That is the cost of sin. It must be put to death. As the apostle Paul says, the wages of sin is death. And that remains true. And Jesus' wrath is justified in destroying utterly my sin of killing it. Therefore, when I receive Jesus, his truth, his love, his redemption, I also am receiving his death as my own because that is the cost of sin. That's, the, that's again, that's the deeper beauty to the, to the sacrifice he gave, right? Sin has always required death to cover it because that's what God's wrath does to sin, destroys it utterly. But Jesus saw, I could not take that death. You could not take that death. He alone could. He didn't eliminate God's wrath. He took it fully. Every bit of it. He allowed all of it to hang heavy on him for you and I, for our sake. But now I can receive his life through his resurrection because just as he died in my place, he rose from the dead as the first of among the dead so that now I can experience his life as well. My old self can now be buried with Christ and my new self has been risen to new life with Jesus, my Lord. Amen? Amen. I'm gonna invite the band to come up. We're gonna land this plane a little bit here today. You see, we need this, right? We, we, we need there to be consequences to our sin. We, we need there to be, right, the impacts, the effects of sin. Otherwise, we, we continue to fall into it. Every good parent knows this, right? We see our kids doing something. No, there's, there's consequences, right? You just go, no, you can't keep doing that. And, and as a good parent, and the answer can't be stop or I'll just say stop again. That doesn't work. Any parent, does that just work? And definitely no, there's gonna be consequences, right? If you do this, there's gonna be this because that never stops. If I don't cause consequences, if I don't seek to keep refining my children, they won't get better. Well, that's me, I'm a knucklehead. How much greater then is God, a holy, righteous father, right? Revealed to us in Jesus Christ, his, right, his wrath is always against sin, always wanting to root it out, always wanting to eliminate it and to kill it utterly in our lives. That never stops. We need it to be there. But praise be to God that he takes the punishment for us. He doesn't eliminate his wrath, he takes it fully. And we don't just need it personally, the world needs it. I see this so clearly when I've had the experience to go to developing countries, the one that jumps out of my mind is I'm driving in the back of a pickup truck and we're weaving in and out of the rubble through the streets of City Soleil in Haiti. And I look over and there in the ditch, just there's, there's refuse and garbage and there's some feral pigs, right? Arguing over, fighting over the garbage in this, in this ditch. And not five feet from those pigs is a child, eight, nine years old, naked from the waist down. Also, arguing over and fighting over the garbage. I just go, Lord, how long? And I need there to be a day, we need there to be a day when the wrath of God says enough. Woe to you. Right, we love the woe for others. We just don't like the woe for ourselves. We need both. We need there to be a day where he says, behold, I am making all things new. And I'll wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more crying. For God now makes his home with us. And for that to happen, there has to be his wrath poured out on sin and evil utterly. You see, for evil to be defeated, 
We need the Lion of Judah to unleash his wrath and to righteously judge. We need it personally, and we need it for our world. He is the Lamb of God, and he is the Lion of Judah. And we praise him that he is both always. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me as I pray? Jesus, we thank you for today. Lord, forgive me, man, for the ways that I have pushed against this. Forgive me for the ways that I've just wanted to deny this part of your very nature and your character because I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. I don't like discipline. I don't like pain. And yet by doing so, I've extended, I've made, I've made my sin, my mistakes, I, I've made them longer, I've made the consequences of it worse for myself and for family, friends, all of that, because I wouldn't just embrace this, this part of who you are. Father, my, I believe that there's many of us, both watching online and here in the room, that have done the same. And then we wonder why we keep falling into the same mistakes. We've t attempted to neuter you somehow, and that's never been true. We praise you as the Lamb of God, and we thank you for being the Lion of Judah. Father, let us, let us live in the reality and the truth of both, <sighs> that we would kneel in confession, that we would walk in humility, and that we would run from sin trusting in you. We pray this in Jesus' name.